In this course, we're gonna build a full production ready RESTful API for an AI SaaS using NestJS, Node.js, Authentication, Postgres, as well as AI models to create this AI SaaS. All right, so let's just quickly go over what is the stack we're gonna use throughout the course to build this RESTful API SaaS. So the first part is NestJS in here. So NestJS is simply a Node.js framework that is very professional, has a lot, a lot of features, and plus uses TypeScript, and it gives you so many awesome cool stuff. And behind the scenes, it actually uses Express, or you can optionally switch it to use Festify. So I'm gonna stick with Express, of course. I'm gonna just go the awesome way in here, and of course, with TypeScript, so that means, yes, we're gonna cover TypeScript along the way. The second part for the database, we're actually gonna jump and use PostgreSQL because it's open source, really widespread ed, and super easy to use as well. And it works perfectly with TypeScript in here for NestJS, and it works perfectly as well with Prisma in here. And Prisma works with TypeScript, so it's like a really nice, awesome combination that we can use. For AI, we can use Replicate, which is a nice platform that gives you, you know, you can deploy your AI models over there, or maybe you can just go ahead and explore and go through the many other thousands of AI models that were already deployed. You can just use the API and get started and working with them, which basically we're gonna be doing. And of course, we shouldn't forget about TypeScript as well. So of course, to get us started with NestJS, we first need to go ahead and actually create a project. We scaffold and create a NestJS project in here. And to use that, you need to go to NestJS. I need to look for the installation. So once you go to docs.nestjs.com and you go to the installation right over here, you can use NPM, but I'm not an NPM fan, so I can use PMPM and I can just do nest new and then give it a project name and done. So for that, I actually can go use this PMPX and you give it like, oh, CLI latest and you do magic and you do magic photo AI. It's actually the project name I want. So now once I click enter, this will show, go ahead and create the project for me and start installing all the dependencies. So first I think it should ask you whether you wanna use um, like what package manager, yeah. So I'm gonna go with PMPM because it's literally the fastest among all of these. And there you go, now everything is installed. We got the project set up. It's like magic photo AI and everything should be good. So now I can go ahead and do CD magic um, photo AI. Okay, I can't type on this Mac keyboard. So I can just go in and CD and it can do code dot to actually access the VS code or open VS code IDE on my projects. Awesome, so now we got the projects. Everything is set up using SGS in here and and the best thing actually uses PMPM. So now I can jump to the pack.json, I can see the different scripts that are available. So, I mean, there's a bunch of them. So most likely you're not gonna need all of these. All you're gonna need in here, just to start out, of course, is the start dev to start the development server in here so you can watch all the files and whenever you change something and click S or control S and control save, it just reloads the whole server for you. So I'm gonna go and just start the server right over here. So I'm gonna use PMPM, do run or I can use run, so I can do start and colon dev. And there you go, so you should start the server. So I went through to the main type script in here, I changed the port. So by default, it uses port 3000, but for me, I wanna use 9000 because 3000 is just too much for all applications to use one port. So I'm just gonna use with 9000 in here, it's less frequent. Now, if I head back in here to Postman, so by the way, I'm gonna use Postman for API testing and actually doing the request and you know visualizing the response in here. It's a really nice tool. So when I been, went back to here to Postman and I just actually went through localhost 9000 port and I did send his and now it tells me the server is working fine. It returns a hello world. So we're good to go. All right, so the second part in here is actually setting up PostgreSQL or Postgres, whatever you wanna call it, with Prisma. Now, the second part is actually to go ahead and set up a PostgreSQL or PostgreSQL, however you wanna call it actually, with Prisma as well, inside of NestJS, inside of the whole application. So before we get started, of course, you need to have Postgres installed inside of your system. So for that, you've got two choices. Basically, you can go to the download page in here, you select your platform, maybe for me, macOS in here, and you can scroll down, and you can use the different ways you can install that using like Postgre app in here, you can download the application and just simply click on it, uh, homebrew, Mac port, however you want it. Or maybe you're like me, you love Docker so much, and it just because you, I don't wanna actually pollute the system, I don't wanna install you know, different databases and just have that much of issues with Docker, you can easily double one version and remove another version super, super quickly and super easily without having that you know configuration issues and you know, you don't want problems in life. So use Docker, and I love to use Docker in here, so you can just go and use PostgreSQL in here, install it quickly, and it can jump between versions and do whatever you want. So 
down here, there's actually the how to install a PostgreSQL sort of instance. Like all you gotta do in here is just go back, copy this one, copy the whole thing, I literally just go back to your terminal in here. So for example, for my terminal, I'm gonna create a new terminal and I'm just gonna go ahead and put that. So I'm gonna, whenever they have this, and before we actually go ahead and start this one, we need to actually choose a PostgreSQL database password. So for that, I would rather just to put all of these inside of like an environment variable file. And I would love to use the EMV just to put my password at first when starting out. So, you know, the application knows about the password and I can easily keep track of them whenever I'm deploying or something. So for example, in here, I can do a PostgreSQL database password in here. And we can go back to Google and go to like a random password generator in here. I can just go ahead and generate a password real quickly. So I'm gonna just do, oh, this is a very strong password. Maybe you can increase that just a little more secure. So I'm gonna choose 20 characters with everything and please use this too as well. So I'm gonna copy this one. Awesome, I don't need you anymore. And I'm gonna go back. So I'm gonna just do control V. I don't know what's not working. And there you go, that space. And I just wanna put these between quotes, you know? I don't wanna keep it like that because quotes always just tells you exactly what is the password between that. All right, cool. So I did that. I'm gonna just go ahead and copy that again. I'm gonna do control V again. So I can have, you know, the password set up in here and I'm gonna give it a name. So here's some PostGree. I'm gonna just do um, AI Postgres, okay? And that's it. So simply as that, enter in here. And of course, because I haven't put the password between quotes, that's why it talks about quotes before. And it's really important to do use quotes. So I'm gonna delete the whole thing in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and put quotes, put everything between quotes again. I had to go through quotes a couple of times for some reason, <laughs> my terminal didn't actually recognize the first quotes, but there you go. Now it should work. I know I put the password and everything and you should go ahead and actually pull the latest PostgreSQL sort of version image from the Docker hub. So just wait a couple of seconds, minutes, depending on your internet connection and you should be good to go. All right, awesome. So it's done right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do um, Docker on the terminal, just Docker PS just to run or see the running script. So I got two things. So I got AI post green here, which all I care about. So it's actually running on port 5432 TCP. And I think I didn't bind the port. So yeah, I'm super stupid. And I think I didn't actually bind the port. So I think that's pretty stupid. So I can just go in and do Docker stop and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna copy this container ID right over here and actually just go back, put this one in here just to stop it. And I'm actually go back and run my other command in here to start it. But this time, before doing the environment variables in here, I'm just gonna go ahead and do P or dash P for the port. And I'm actually gonna bind 5432 to 5432, okay? Just gonna use the same port in here just for safety. And then, and of course, just to be a little more familiar with that. So I'm gonna click enter. So I need to do Docker remove again. So I'm gonna just use the stop command he did use before. I'm gonna go ahead and remove, or maybe RM. Yep, that's good. And I can just go ahead and do the run again. So this should go ahead and run Docker PS and it should just actually go ahead and bind that to the right port right over here. So that's good. Now, the next thing here is actually setting up Prisma. So Prisma should be pretty straightforward because the documentation or their documentation is so, so nice. And it actually has all the information you need to set up Prisma as quickly and as smoothly as possible. So here, it just simply tells you to go ahead and install Prisma, which we can actually go ahead and do using PMPM. Then you just, or maybe you can invoke the Prisma CLI in here like this, MPX Prisma, and you just go ahead and use the initialize and you're good to go. So going back in here, so simply to install that, you just do PMPM add and you just do Prisma and you do do dash dash save def, okay? And this should go ahead and install and save Prisma as a development dependency. Awesome, now we got Prisma installed. The next thing is actually to do PMPX and you just do Prisma init, okay? This should go ahead and initialize the project for you, create like a Prisma folder right here for you with you know all the configuration, the schema and everything that you need. There you go, so you put the Prisma in here, it has the Prisma schema, which has basically everything that you need. As clear as when you have this data source for the DB and it tells you, oh, the provider, I wanna use PostgreSQL and it's just actually coming up by default from Prisma and the URL in here, I wanna use the database URL, which is coming from the environment variable. So we should go ahead and copy this one, go back to the ENV in here. I think you already did put something for us and there you go, I think, oh yeah, okay. So that's pretty cool. You can encode everything as a URL in here. That is pretty sick. So I don't need this PostgreSQL DB password 
separately anymore. I just go in and put the database URL in here. And in order to put everything for me in here, so PostgreSQL, it put me like a format I can use and uses localhost and it uses a default port by default. And this actually should be the name of our database and schema public. Okay. So, all right. So in order to get access to actually the user, the password, of course, we already know that. And local hosting is actually, you know, the local host, this is the right port. But of course, we still need to create a database for that to work properly. So to do that, I could go ahead and actually into the terminal in here and actually use Docker. So just type in Docker PS in here to access all the running Docker containers. And of course, we want to access, you know, the Postgres SQL in here container that we just run in. So you just do Docker execute and you do IT in here for interactive shell. And you just go ahead and copy the actual container ID in here that you want to access, just do control C and control V and you give it bash in here. So you can just like forward that container or that interactive shell using bash. So just click enter into this one. And there you go. Now you actually inside of that container, the Docker container, now to access Postgres, you need to use P SQL and you just do dash U in here for, or sorry, H for the local host and dash uppercase U in here for the actual user. And by default, Postgres uses user Postgres, you guessed it right. So click enter in this one and you are right into this one or not yet because I yeah, mistyped that. There you go. Now we are inside to view all the databases. Just do backslash dash or backslash L in here for accessing and viewing all the databases. You can easily access all of those and that's pretty good. And simply in here, we want to create a database like for users just to keep track of all the users that were registered when they log in, when we give them like an API key. So now for actually creating a database, just go ahead and do create database and just give it the name in here. For us, I'm just going to go ahead and do magic dash AI maybe, or just, just magic AI in here all put together. So just going to do that Colin and the database should be created. If you want to ever access a database, just do forward slash or backslash C in here and you give it the database name, which is magic AI for us. You click now and there you go. Now you connected to magic AI. Okay, cool. So let's quit the database. Just do backslash Q again. Everything is backslashes in Postgres and just go ahead and do exit. Now, cool. Now we're good to go in here. Just going to clear that out and get back into our NV file. Now here I can change this to the user, which is Postgres by default set before. Now for the password and I can copy my password from the top in here and completely replace it with this one. And I should use single quotes instead of double quotes because they are already being used. So I just go back in here for single quotes and it's localhost that writes. And this is actually the port that I want to use. Now for database, it's going to be magic AI. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now to actually make sure that Prisma works perfectly with Nest.js, and of course, because Nest.js is taking care of the projects, and it's actually the framework that powers our projects. So we need to set it up properly with Nest.js. So for that, it actually has a very detailed documentation of how you install it, what you need and how to make it work with that. So I'm just going to give you some ideas. And of course, we're going to go ahead and set up that one. So first, make sure to install Prisma client in here, which actually going to take care of generating some like schemas for us for Prisma and actually connect into the database. So simply just use npm or whatever, just to go ahead and install Prisma client right over here. So I'm going to go back in here, pm, pm, add, and I'm just going to do Prisma client, not say save dev. Yes, it's just it's the normal dependency in here. All right, that's pretty good. So now it's actually installed in everything. Now I can go back to my SRC in here and actually can go in and create a new project or new folder in here. I'm going to call this DB and inside of it, right inside of that one folder, I'm just going to go ahead and do prisma.service the TypeScript. And it's just going to be like a service that takes care of connecting to the Prisma database or connecting to the database using Prisma to be a little more specific. And this is actually the boil pre copied from the Nest.js, which is super good. Actually uses the injectable in here. And if you're not familiar with Nest.js, I have like a full video course of how to use Nest.js from scratch for beginners. So if you're not familiar with how Nest.js works and all these injectables and services and modules and stuff like that and controllers, I would highly recommend just going and watching that video. It's going to give you everything you need as quick as possible. You can come back in here. And of course, you're going to find the video down in the description or maybe in the top over here. I don't know, but you're going to find it somewhere. So this simply uses and declares the Prisma service that extends the Prisma clients and implements this old module in it to initialize that one. It basically just go ahead and connects, which is, you know, this method is provided by the Prisma client in here, which simply connects to that. 
And literally, that's all you need to set up Prisma with Postgres. I know we haven't connected that one just yet, but for the connection to work, we need to first go ahead and actually create our schema. And the schema or the Prisma schema in here is going to allow us to define the tables that we want to put inside of the database for it to work perfectly. So of course, maybe something like users table for keeping track of the users and stuff like that. All right, so now we need to jump into the schema. So just go to Prisma, schema.prisma in here. And actually right here, we actually where we define our table schema that are gonna go inside of the database. So first, I wanna create a users table to keep track of all the users that are registered. And so we can give them, you know, access to the, to the API with like an API key and stuff. So this is simply what it should look like. So just like model, a user, you give it like an ID with an integer and actually auto increments. And this is basically like the default. Of course, you always wanna do that. The email in here should be unique and have like a password, which is, you know, like the normal password of the user. We've got an API key that should be unique as well, created at and updated at. And these are all like, you know, these two in here, the created ads and updated are like date values that come by default from Prisma. So like you can do default now, which is gonna give you the current date that when a new record gets saved and updated on here, it's just like a special record that gets generated by Prisma whenever there's an update on that particular record, which is so, so good. All right, so in order to actually synchronize that particular schema with our database and let like, you know, Prisma take the heavy lifting for us and create all those tables inside of Postgres and everything, we need to create a migration. So a migration is simply telling Prisma or any other ORM basically has migrations, basically like to keep synchronizing between, you know, any new schema changes and what the database has already. So for example, every single time you make a schema change, it's not gonna automatically reflect unless you're mainly in development, but most of the times it's not gonna reflect that it's not a good idea to for it to like synchronize and reflect immediately, but it's good actually to create a migration. And what migration is, it's like basically a script that takes that new schema change and alters the data database regardingly to that and actually just you know respects exactly what is on the database what tables that needs to be altered maybe properties or columns that needs to be altered all that kind of things it puts it inside of that script to get everything sorted out the right way so for us to create a migration we simply just going to do a pmpx in here so just do pmpx i'm going to use prisma of course so i'm going to do pmpx prisma and i'm going to do migrate I'm gonna use dev in here because I'm in a dev environment, it's not production or anything. And you can give it the name, so dash dash name. So for the name in here, I'm gonna just do uh, create users table. So just like a reference for you, so that's it. So this should go ahead and create um, a, you know, a migration for us right away. So as far as I can tell, actually giving us some issues with the password in here because basically it has like, you know, and at which is not correct with you know it's, it won't work with the current string because it kind of interfere with special characters and let's hope this works so simply in here i'm just going to go in with a safe bet for now is i should just go ahead and change the password into something a little special or a little simpler with no special characters so i'm just going to go back in here i already connected the database the same way we did before using docker i access p sql in here and i'm actually just doing alter user postgres with password and i'm using this a little simpler sort of password and I'm just going to copy paste it and click enter and this should alter the rule for me. So if I literally go back right over here, I think it's right here. So I can just copy that one. I think that should work. Hopefully, please. And uh, let's go back into this one. I, I, I think I need to go ahead and create another terminal. I don't want to destroy the other one and PMPX. Um, And there you go. Now, after running the command again with the new password, it looks like it's working. It created the migration for us. If you go now inside of Prisma folder and migrations folder, and you're gonna find the migrations or whatever there, instead of that folder, you're gonna find migration.sql, which is a raw SQL script that has raw SQL, of course, syntax in here to actually just go ahead and run everything. So that is, should work absolutely fine. It has basically, you know, the command that actually go ahead and writes that into the database or basically create a table for that with the constraints and unique index and everything. So that should work fine. Now, again, if you want to check if that migration was applied for you, so you just go back to psql, run that one, access the database right again. And now we can just use another command, which is, or simply the first thing, 
And of course, you make sure to access and actually use that database. So I can use Magic AI first. Now we connect to Magic AI, and I can just use DT in here to display all the available tables. And for us, there is the user table in here that was created for us, and the owner is Postgres. And of course, it has another special table in here created by Prisma for keeping track of all the migrations that were applied. All right, so everything now is set up with Prisma, database, Postgres, all good. Now, the next most important step in an API or RESTful API as a service or SaaS sort of API or a SaaS basically. So we need to create a way for users to sign up and register inside of our application or inside of our you know API to actually use API and a way to log in or more particularly because we don't have like a dashboard where you can log in and see you know or all your stuff and everything like others do. We just want to use like a simple API, just providing an API. Everything can be handled throughout the API. So for that, maybe we can do a login or maybe you can just do another route that just you give it a username, a password of yours, and it just generate for you an API key. And through that API key, you can just go ahead and request and, and you know, interact with our API for like using the AI functionality and generating images and stuff like that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, let's go ahead and start. So first things first, I'm going to create a new folder, I'm going to call it auth. And inside of that auth folder in here, I'm just going to go ahead and do Created like an auth module. So I'm going to do auth.module.timescript. Okay. So here I'm going to do at module. And of course, when you do at module, and here's going to automatically tell you where you want to import that from. So I'm going to import it from modules and I want to just do imports as empty array. And I want to do uh, providers as empty array and as well controllers. So control is empty array in here. And here I can just go and create a class. I'm going to call it auth module in here. And that's it. So I'm just make sure to export the class as well. So we can, you know, everybody can access that one. Okay, so it should be good to go. Now let's go ahead and create another one, which is going to create a service for ourselves. So I'm going to do auth service, which is just going to act as a provider. So provider is the same thing as a service. Now this one will be acting like, you know, just a service like class that has, you know, the core functionality for like signing up, logging in, generating API tokens and stuff like that. So we can delegate whenever a new request comes through to like the sign up route, for example, or the login route, for example, we can just take that from the controller and delegate it directly to basically the auth service in here. So I can just use injectable. And of course, we're going to be imported for you from NestJS common. And here, I'm just going to go and export a class It's going to be auth service. So auth service in here, and it's going to have a couple of methods that we want to use. So for example, we can do async and it can do sign up method in here. So that is going to sign up and that method should you know have everything in here, well, the logic for signing up. And before we start doing that, we need to actually go ahead through the constructor in here and it can do private. So when you use private in here, right into the constructor parameters here, it allows you to immediately initiate and put a property inside of the class scope in here of whatever instance you want to create right over here. So for example, I can do private and I want to create using Prisma and we can do Prisma and you can do colon Prisma service. Remember the survey we created before inside of the DB in here, the Prisma service. Now for that Prisma service to work, we need to import it inside of the auth module in here as a provider. And I think how I'd like to do that is actually inside of a DB and instead of creating only a service, it's way much better to go ahead and create that as a module a whole. And you know, the Prisma module in here or the DB module is going to have the Prisma service as part of it. So here is inside of the DB here, I can go and do like oh DB dot module dot TypeScript, for example. And inside of that one, you can just use the module annotation again, I can just put you know, imports and whatever there is in here, uh, maybe you can just put providers and I can do Prisma service. So make sure to import that one inside of that word and just do export class and DB module or maybe um, database module. Okay, and that's our module in here. Now again, now inside of the auth module right here, we can just go into the imports and actually import the DB module. So we can directly access the Prisma service with no issues. So I can just do database module in here. And inside of the imports, of course, it's going to import the module for me in here. And before you can actually easily access Prisma in here, you need to go in and do pmpx Prisma generate, you need to run that one to make sure that Prisma client that the client is going to be generated for you by the Prisma CLI in here is synchronized with your Prisma schema that you've already actually put in here. So it has, you know, everything that you've got inside of the database, and you can have sweet types, creates types and interlicense ready made for you. 
So after doing that, you should everything work. It should easy to do. You just press this dot prisma dot, and you can access whatever. And what we want to access is actually a dot user, and you can just go ahead and use the create one. Now for the create, of course, it's going to take a couple of arguments, and basically these arguments are going to be like you know whatever that needs to be creating a record or a user record inside of a database. So something like email, password, API key. And to make sure we get that working, we need some parameters in here that needs to be passed into the sign up method in here, which is, you know, the sign up inside of the old service in order to be able to pass it to create in here so we can create a new record using Prisma. So before doing all of that, we need to create something that is called D2O or data to objects. And before doing that again, we need to create a, or install a couple of packages in here that's actually going to help us create this D2O with automatic validation that's going to be taken care of by NestJS itself. So for that, I just go and do like PMPM PM, add and I need to add a class validator and yup. So class validator is just like a package that allows you to validate class properties, which is going to work really well with our D2 in here. And yup in here is just like a validation or schema validation library that allows you to, you know, just define a specific schema and tell it to validate up in the data that gets get it received on that particular schema. So we got the class validator and the up in here, make sure to install them as regular dependencies, not dev dependencies. All right, so now once they are done, we've got the server in here should work fine. I can go back to the auth in here, I need to create a new folder that's called d2l. And inside of that particular folder in there, I go ahead and create a file that's called like oh, sign up d 2 lTypescript Okay, and simply this will actually go ahead and export a class that's going to represent our d 2 o or you know, like particularly the schema we're going to receive from the request that's going to allow us to create a new record inside of the users or sign up a new user. So I'm going to do a class, I'm going to do sign up D2O. And here we can list the different properties we've got. So for example, I need all I simply need in here is just the email, so it's going to be a string, and I need a password for the you know, to sign up the user. Now for that, we need to add some validation, we can leave it like this, but it's not going to work as perfect, you can, you know, use it, whatever, but it's not going to have validation, it's not going to validate Oh, if the email here is a string, and it's not number, or if the email in here is an actual email, and it's not just random characters put together consecutively, something of that sort. So we can just use the validation, we can use the package that we just created, or we just installed the class validator and the up. And with that, we're just going to import like, oh, for example, is email, and this will just as you in here is going to implement that or basically bring that from the class validator. So you're going to import it from right over there. So is email and is string in here, and by default is going to be required. So if you want to include it or make it optional, you can do is optional. And the same thing in here goes for the password. For example, I can do oh a string. So the password should be a string in here, and the password should be. Oh, this should be a capital letter in here. And the same thing, I don't know why I imported that one, but I don't need that. And it should something like, oh, you want to do minimum length in here. So just do minimum length, maybe the password should be at minimum. And to actually to make sure that our password is strong enough, I'm going to use a regular expression to check if the password is good enough or not. So I'm going to do just matches in here, which is a function that takes a regular expression, and you can give it a regular expression right in here. And that's actually our password regular expression. It's just like going to take, you know, one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, minimum eight characters in here, which I'm already checking in here, but you can just leave it because that was generated by chat GPT. So we can leave it for now. I mean, that should be pretty good, it should be straightforward. And of course, I need also between these, I need one special character. So everything's good. And the second parameter here you can pass is actually a message that gets displayed back or sent back on the response of like the invalid data response in here to back to the user in here telling him exactly what's happening and what it needs to be fixed. For example, for this regular expression, I don't want to just leave it like this, I want to say, Oh, please, uh, choose a, like a strong password or something. Okay, there you go. So that should be good. We've got easy email is string minimum length matches in here. All right, sweet. So if we go back in here, I can just go to use the D2O right over here. So I can do sign up D2O. And I can just use you know, the sign up D2O I just used in there. And simply I can just pass in the sign up D2O in here, but it needs to be inside of the data. So I just do data and sign up D2O. Oh, wait a second, if you look at the error in here, it tells us, oh, basically, the API key in here is 
required and it's literally missing in here because I'm not gonna let the user choose this API key. So we need to figure out some code in here that is gonna generate an API key, like a very random, then hash that API key, then put it inside of the DB record in here on the sign up for each user that actually registers. I know there's actually tons of ways you can implement that while like on login or maybe you can have an interface where people can just go through uh, different stuff and it can like create another API maybe where people can call and revoke an API token and get a new one generated. We can add that too, but I just want to have the simplest approach in here that works well and it's you know, secure as well. Like on the sign up in here, you generate an API key, like a random string that's impossible to be generated twice in a millions times or billions times. So the first thing here we can do is just to use the crypto, which is available from Node.js. And it's a package that actually allows you to use this method that random UUID to generate a very random UUID that is, you know, has like one, two, three, four, five strings can candidate it together. So it's very impossible for this to be, you know, generated twice. So that's good. We got this one. So I'm going to just do, oh, const random uh, UUID. So it just equals to that. So good. We got a random one. Now, the next thing in here, we need to hash this. And there's actually a really good library that works really, really well. I mean, you can use Node.js stuff. So yes, go to installation in here, pmpm add, and it's called bcrypt. So just do add bcrypt in here. It's going to install the bcrypt library, which is a hashing library. And there you go. So it's done. Now I can just go and use the bcrypt. I don't know if it can just auto import that or have to go on the top. I can do import bcrypt in here from bcrypt. So this should go ahead and import bcrypt for me. So I can go down in here. I don't know, but maybe it needs to install types or something for it. So since it doesn't actually have declaration types or TypeScript declaration types, I'm going to go ahead and use pmpm add at types bcrypt to make sure maybe it has types over there. I believe it would. So if it does have types, it's going to give us, you know, all the interlices and everything and we can access the methods. So hallelujah, it has the types and it works well. So it got installed. Now I can do bcrypt and it can has have access basically to all the methods in here with, you know, the documentation that I need. So the first part in here is actually to generate a salt. And the first simple thing in here, because of course he uses a promise. So I'm going to give it a round, maybe 10 rounds in here. I don't need a minor or anything. So I'm going to use the weights. So simply just do weights in here and do const uh, random salt. And another one. So hashed API key. And I'm going to do a weight again, bcrypt. I'm going to do hash. So this one, you actually give it like the data that you want to hash, like the string or whatever. And of course, for us, it's going to be the random UID. The second, okay, so random UID. The second part in here is going to be the salt. So I'm going to just do random salt. And there you go. So this should one, this basically like the hash API key in here should have the final hash API key with, you know, the random salt that we just generated. And now instead of the sign up DTO in here, I can just, you know, put that, make sure to clone that object so I can do API key equals to our hashed API key. Okay, that's good. And now it doesn't complain anymore. And I got this like, oh, create and everything. I can just go ahead and return this one because create returns an absolute like a promise and everything and it returns the data. So you know, instead of waiting for that one or something, you gotta use a wait or maybe you can just go into return because it has an asynchronous in here and it should work fine. All right, cool. So next thing in here, we need to create an authentication controller. So for that, I'm going to do auth.controller.typescript. And this one's going to be a class. So export class um, auth controller again. And well, apparently for this one, I need to do, you know, import the controller, use the at controller in here to mark it as a controller. It doesn't need parentheses on top. All right, perfect. So the next thing in here, I need to use the constructor. I'm going to do private. And maybe I can just do read only in here because I don't want that change. And I can do auth service to be coming from the auth service. And for that, just to quickly make sure that the auth module has a provider auth service, which it doesn't. And likely for me, I, I got that one before a bug happened or before I, I crashed with an error. So and the controls as well. So I'm going to use the auth controller before anything goes wrong. So we got that one there. The other one is working fine as well. So we got uh, auth service, auth service with a constructor. Now, so next in here, can you use the post handler in here just to tell you that, oh, we want to use a post handler in here. So make sure to import that from Nest.js common. And that should be forward slash, you know, sign up, like the regular. And I can just do async sign up again. And I can use the DTO right now. 
but the GTO a little bit differently because I need to use the body. So this body is simply gonna tell that, oh, go ahead inside of that post request and access the body of that post request and grab it for me and put it inside of this variable. For example, I'm gonna call this sign up D2O and make sure because we already created, you know, remember that class validator and class D2O that we just put right over here. So we're gonna actually tell it that this should be a type of a sign up D2O or more of like an instance of that. That means it should go ahead and actually validate for us everything automatically using the validators we've put on top in here inside of those properties and it makes sure that it matches. If it doesn't, it's just gonna go ahead and return an invalid or bad request response back to the user before it comes and continues with our work with our handlers in here. So the user knows immediately, oh, something is wrong with my request. So I need to, you know, follow like whatever instructions or errors it's actually telling to fix that first before I can make another request. So I can just do, you know, sign up DCO again in here and that should be good. Now, before you do anything in here, I'm just gonna do console log and I'm gonna just do console log the actual body in here and I wanna console log the sign up. So I'm gonna just do uh, not this sign up, but the sign up D2O. Okay, control S in here. Now, actually go ahead and run this server. I should be running if I look back into this one. I mean, oh yeah, I forgot. I need to include this auth method or auth module in here inside of the app service or the app module in here for it to be working perfectly. So I need just to go ahead and do auth module, make sure to import that one, save it. And there you go. We got a bunch of errors. All right, so this error in here is telling us, oh, uh, Nest cannot resolve the dependencies of the auth service. Please make sure the argument Prisma service at index zero is available in the auth module context. So if you jump to the auth module in here, I mean, we are importing the database module. That's where the Prisma service exists. So if you open up the database module in here, we've got the providers Prisma service. Okay, so there's one teeny tiny issue. We need to make sure they export whatever providers you define at every single module you've got inside of your NestJS application. So for example in here, because this Prisma service exists inside of like the database module, for other modules to be able to access actually use that one, you need to export it first. So make sure to export Prisma service as well in here and click as and there you go. So it got the error fixed for us in here and the next application is running fine. Plus we got this new mapped route. The forward slash sign up is with a post or sorry, with a post request working fine. So I'm gonna go to postman in here. I'm gonna put sign up. I'm gonna change it from get to post and I'm gonna click enter and I don't see anything actually. So I don't know what's going on. It just like returns empty things and it do a one. Maybe you need to put a body first. I'm gonna go with row and I'm gonna make sure that it's actually a JSON. So I'm gonna to try to put something like email at me, something like that and actually send it and it's doing nothing. All right, so after looking into the NestJS out like documentation here, it's actually what's going on. First, we need to make sure that we use a global pipe that is called the validation pipe in here inside of like the bootstrap function, inside of like, you know, the main file in here for NestJS. The second part is actually we need to install another package that we missed before, which is the class transformer. I really like install only the class validator, but we need to do the class transformer as well for this to work perfectly. So yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So before in here, I'm gonna jump right to the ZSH. I'm gonna go back, gonna do pmpm add class transformer. Okay, cannot type, where is the N? Uh, all right, that's good. So that should add for us the class transformer. That should be good. I'm gonna go back to the main in here inside of the bootstrap. I'm gonna do up dot use global pipes, not filters, not interceptors. I'm gonna do new validation pipe. And that should be imported from NestJS common. That should work. So if I save that one, it should actually go ahead and like restart the whole server for me, I hope. But maybe in case if it doesn't, I'm just gonna go ahead and force restart in here from scratch. And SGS is starting perfectly. So after going back to here, sign up, there you go. Now it works. So email must be an email. Please choose a strong password. Password must be longer or equal to eight characters. Password must be string, error, bad request, and the status code is 400. Now, if I don't send anything at all, what's gonna happen? Yeah, it's gonna give you all the sort of messages that you need to do, like what is the actual schema that you need to fix and all the type of errors you've got. So that is actually pretty good. I love that one. And now I can just go ahead and do my email. So for example, instagram at, e, at me.com and a password should be like strong 
past one, two, three, or sorry, one, two, three, then uh, an exclamation mark. And I forgot about the password. So password, and there you go. Now send it back again. There you go. Now we got 200 and created. And if we jump back into the terminal in here, it's actually printing our body and the body has email and password. Okay, so the final part here, just to stitch between the auth service and our signup controller in here. So it's just simply just sign up auth service dot sign up and all you gotta do, just sign, press passing the sign up DCO in here and maybe you just wanna like return that because it's gonna return that data for you and you don't need to do anything about it. But I think there's one teeny tiny thing you might wanna actually do with that is because this actually gonna return the whole data and probably including the password as well. So we don't wanna do that, but I mean, there is actually another way. So we can just do return in here, auth service, sign up, and I can jump right into our service in here. And you see like when we created the data in here, I can do another one, which is a select query. Like what's actually gonna select as a return type, so like whatever is gonna be returned by this create method, it should first go like by this filter, or like the select filter we're gonna be just putting right over here. So like whatever you put, in here, so for example, select, for example, ID, yes, true, put me the ID, or I think, or yeah, I think you, you gotta do it like this way. So name in here, true, um, API key, true, we don't have a name, so it's gonna be email, password is not, so I'm gonna just create it at true and update it at. So this way, whenever we return, you know, the create data in here for our user, we're not gonna return back the password because that's really bad and not secure at all. So just simply like return all these fields in here and that should be good. So if we jump back in here, we got all service, sign up, sign up in here, we're just simply returning it. And we're gonna just go in and change that or simply just that on like postman in here, I'm gonna go send this one. And there you go, we got an internal server error. So it looks like crypto module is not defined. So let me just go ahead and check what is going on with this crypto. So I'm gonna go back in here. We got the crypto in here. Let me just go ahead and import crypto because I think we need to import crypto. So I'm gonna just do from crypto and that's that's the crypto thing. So we should import crypto in here and I think it should work now. So Postman, test that one again. I don't know, but in here in the documentation, it says it needs to be node then crypto for some reason. So apparently I had to do like import all as crypto for this to work for some reason. And I'm probably gonna need to do the same thing for bcrypt because it's actually giving me the same error. So I did both of these. I'm gonna actually go back in here, save it and hallelujah. So we got our API key in here. It's like very randomly generated, which I love that, but I don't know why the dot exists in there. So maybe it's because of like the hashing and everything. We got the email, created at, updated at, and the ID. Cool, now if you just, you know, check the database, obviously you're gonna find the record state over there for you. And actually, you don't actually wanna go inside of the database again and use the, you know, the command line and everything. Prisma actually gives you a really awesome tool called Prisma Studio, which is a browser sort of application that just allows you to check the records and manipulate it however you want. So you can just do PMPX, again, Prisma and Studio. And this should go ahead and start the studio for you. I don't exactly remember what is the port, but we should see it in a second. And there you go, it should open for you like, you know, localhost 555, and you got all the modules in here. So like the models we have, or the model we have in here is the user, if you click on it, we got the record in here we just created. For some reason, oh, I, I completely, I think I completely forgot about like putting the, or hashing the password, I, I should have done that. So that's actually another simple fix in here. So I can just do, oh, password equals await bcrypt hash, and I can give it uh, again the salts. And before that, I need to give it like the sign of D2O dot password. And this should go ahead and generate this using the same random salt we used in here, which is gonna generate for us a password. And I can simply inside of the data, we can just put password to be password. So just save that one again. The server should be running and working fine, I guess. I can go back in here, select this one, delete the record because I don't need that anymore. And it can go back to Postman, click that one, send it again, it generates another ID for us. If I go ahead and refresh, we got another record. Now the password, both of them. So the password is hashed from us, so that's good. And the API key is, is of course hashed for us and it looks really good as well. So yeah, there you go. We got a sign up functionality with API key generation and password generation and alongside an email. All right, that's pretty good. We've got the sign up working. Now, the next step actually to get this into the next level and actually allow people to access our you know, servers and our 
AI sort of service, they need to like log in or maybe use another route to actually get the API key or API access key that we just created like this API key in here for them to be able to access our APIs. So for that, we need to go ahead and create another method here that's actually going to actually allow us to do that and actually retrieve the API key using username or email and password provided through the API key or through the route and return an API key for that. All right, so you've got sign up in here. I'm going to just go a little bit down in here. I'm going to do uh, asynchronous. I'm going to do, you can do login, but I think I'm going to use something like, I'm going to name it get access key or yeah, I think access key would be perfect for that. So I'm just going to do get access key. This should be a promise that returns a string, of course. And and here for the parameters, it's going to take like the access key D2L, which is basically going to be the same in as sign up D2L. So I'm just going to go to the sign up in here, copy that one. And I'm going to go to this D2L, do uh, access key dot D2O dot TypeScript. So I'm just going to go ahead and paste that same thing. I'm going to do access key D2O. And we're going to basically have the same thing, like the email and the password. That's all we need to authenticate the person and see if it's good. Now, we don't need this matches anymore. So we don't need man minimum length a string. We don't need or basically we just need that it should be a string, but nothing more. Same thing with the email and string. I think this is actually a good validation. And going back in here, I'm just going to do access key D2O in here and it should be access key D2O. All right, awesome. So we've got access to that one in here. Let's go in and do it using Prisma. So I'm going to just do Prisma or this dot Prisma dot user dot find. And I'm going to do find first because, you know, API key should be a lucky like unique key and email and password should be unique as well, or particularly email. And um, yeah, so it's like the combination of email and password should give us a unique record of a user. So we just do find first. And here we can give you the query, like select, um, like what I want to select in here. So I'm just going to go do email. Uh, or I think I can just do access DTO in here, or maybe I should specify email. So access DTO dot email and password from bcrypt okay that's good and we got generating the salt so bcrypt generating salts and 10 uh the random uid in here is just going to be our key and we don't need that one because basically doing the same thing so this one i'm simply just going to go ahead and do like oh, return this after it's done we've got random salts and you just like hashing using bcrypt in here and just returning it all right, cool. So let's get back in here. I'm going to go right into, well, I think for the sign up in here, it's actually pretty fine just to leave it as is because they are actually using the same salt and I don't want to actually run another generate salt in here, which if we replace it with this function, that's actually what's going to do behind the scenes. And it's going to just make it a little slower. So I'm just going to leave it as is in here. It works perfectly, but I'm going to down, go down in here for access key. I'm going to do uh, const hashed password i'm just going to use utils in here to do hash string and i'm just going to do access d2o dot password okay and this should give me that but i gotta make sure to do a way to get the hash password in here and when i do the comparison i gotta go ahead and use the hash password that just um i've got okay it's not bcrypt hash but hashed password and here is not selects in prisma it's where yeah i just uh forgot about that one. So that should be working fine. Do where email, this is the email, this is the password, please return for me and a user. And want to say it does. So I'm just going to go ahead and do like a oh, return. And for that, what we can actually go ahead and do simply is we like the same trick we did before, we can just use the selects in here. And the selects should be an object, I just give it Oh, I just want the API key, that's literally all I want. So I just do API key true. And this if you just put return await in this one, and I should do uh, true. Yeah, but I think we still because here we're just like accepting a string. So I think it's better just to go ahead and do result equals await and here just to do result or API key. Okay, and simply just return that one and that should be working. And going back to the control in here. So I think we can do the same thing on the sign up. So we use post and everything. Because of course, we want to get the access key key and, and the post in here should have like as a body It should take of the email and the password and those are like very secure and they should be transmitted in a secure way. And of course, should use HTTPS and all that kind of stuff. Plus, you should transfer this in a post request. So that's exactly what I do. I'm going to just do access key. And on the top in here, I'm just going to make my access dash key maybe. 
So that should be good enough. We got the body in here. I'm just gonna do access key D2L and I'm gonna basically the same thing in there, access key D2O. And uh, I can just log that one. And here, instead of the sign up, I can just go ahead and do oh, get access to your key, please. And I can just all I need to give it is the access key D2L. And this should go ahead and like return for me a promise string in here. And I think just like instead of returning a, a raw string immediately, I think it's better just go back in here. You see this one because it has like it can we can make it look like this where it returns an API key or an object that has an API key as a string and we can just completely remove that one we did before. And here on the await, we can immediately return and that's going to be like immediately returned by the Frisma find first and this should work perfectly. So like instead of returning that one, now it's going to return API key and it's going to return the string of that and that should work fine. So click and turn that and save in. So I'm going to go back to post menu here. I'm going to click on duplicate tab just to create another tab in here. I'm just going to do access dash key still using post the body is still the same because we need to use email password click send and we're getting nothing for some reason so the issue in here is actually we cannot use bcrypt where we hash the password when you go into the database and check if that hash password is same as like you know the stored hash password already no we cannot do that but bcrypt provides you with this method that allows you to compare between like the encrypted one and the password or like the plain password that you've got in here so instead of doing hash string in here, what we should do is actually we cannot look for the password using hash password. So simply we need to look with the email, I can remove the select in here safely because I don't want to get the whole thing. I'm going to just like do this like as um, found a user or something. Now we got the found user using email, the next step is actually to go ahead and check if the current password that was received and compare it with a hash one. So to do that, we can use bcrypt the same thing. So do bcrypt it has this compare method that allows you to compare between the plain data. So like access key dot password and the encrypted string in there, which is going to be on like the found user dot password. And then should return a promise with a Boolean so that simply we can just go ahead and do like oh const is has access or something and await then do be create compare then you get is has access in here. Now no longer need this hash string in here, we can just leave the other method over there, but we no longer need that one. So here what we can check is oh, if is has access, which is like, you know, true and everything, we can just go back and return the same schema we've got on top in here, which is like an object of so an API key. So I can just go ahead and do like return API key to be found a user and do dot API key. So as simple as that, that's correct and everything. But else, if it doesn't actually have the access and if the password is not right, all you simply can do is just go in and throw a new and authorized exception from NestJS in here. Maybe you can just give it up. Oh, you do not uh, have access or something. Okay, so that's good. We're throwing exceptions in here and that should work fine now. So the control in here just created like oh access key we did post to access dash key and we take in body we're grabbing the access key dto access key dto in here we've got the key then we use auth service to get an access key just providing the dto in here and this should return for us this api string and now should everything be good so we go back to postman in here create a new request with email password click submit in here there you go and how it checks and it looks good and it, and it just like finds it really well and it got the api key in here and there's actually one bad mistake in here we did because now we are turning like a hashed api key in here so instead of doing that one i mean it won't work that way so gotta go back in here to the sign up so instead of like we're hashing the api key i can just go in and safely remove that one and just here on the hash api key you can just use the random uid because once you hash it you cannot go back i completely forgot about that one sorry with that guys but this one it should work like this way you just put it like random uid i mean there's tons of ways you can actually implement that one but i just want the you know simplest one just for the sake of the video and everything but you can think of something a little more advanced for that SAS kind of thing. So this random UI just put inside of the API key. Now whenever we register, we should just like return the plain API key in here, not hashed or not encrypted or anything. And that should work fine. So I can go back in here and just like remove the record in here. So like delete the record, like our record. And we go back in here, just like to the sign up register again, we should get oh API key, this is actually our API key right over here. And whenever we try to do access API key, I can just go ahead and do access API key. And there you go, I got the plain API key, and it should work fine now. 
All right, so the next step in here is actually to create an authentication guard. So basically in Nest.js, a guard is like acts like a middleware. So you give it like a request and it checks if that request is valid or has the authorization to pass through to the request handler or not. So if it doesn't have like authorization, just gonna block it. It's not gonna pass to the like auth handler or the sign up or whatever in here. But if it does have that, we can just like, you know, continue the normal to the route handler or something. So for the garden here, I can just go to auth in here, I can click and to create a new file and do um, auth guard dot typescript. And here I've copied like something from from like the Nest.js documentation in here for the auth guard It's just like a simple implementation. So you gotta go go ahead and actually create an injectable, which is a class of auth guard, for example, and it implements can activate. So why is that? Because you need to implement this specific method that takes the execution context and the execution context in here is just like the current application context or the current server context that are gonna provide you with the request and everything that you need, and it's just gonna basically return a promise boolean in here whether it should pass or not and as curious in here we're doing request equals context dot switch to http dot get request and this is basically going to go ahead and return for us the actual http request and right over here what we need to do go ahead and actually go ahead and do is through the request because the api key will be sent through the headers so we're going to just go ahead and check the headers if it has the correct api key and we go inside of the database we check if that api key belongs to any of the users and it's valid if yes we allow it to pass otherwise we're just going to return false that means you know there's no passing for you today so simply in here, just go ahead and extract the header or the API key header, API key header in here. I'm gonna do like, oh, uh, this should be the request dot headers. And you can just go ahead and access the API dash key because that's what I wanna actually name it. So I'm gonna just go ahead and check if not API key here, I just go ahead and return false for you in here. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and use Prisma. So if this, I'm gonna just go ahead and use Prisma. And of course, before using Prisma, you gotta go ahead and do the constructor and actually use the Prisma service that we did before. And now you can just go ahead and do all oh, this dot Prisma. And you can just go to user dot find first. And here I can just do, go ahead and do where, and this should go ahead and look using the API key. So I'm gonna just do API key header. And here is of course gonna return like a wait. So I'm gonna do a wait and I'm just gonna be returning found a user. And a wait in here, of course, we need to make sure that this is an asynchronous function. And this should return that not on observable because we don't need that, just need a promise for this one. And yeah, we got the found user in here. So simply we can just go ahead and check. Oh, if not found a user or it. Or if found user dot API key doesn't actually match the API key header we've got, then just simply return false. Otherwise, just return true. And this should work fine. All right, now it's actually time to go ahead and start working on the core API features or our you know API here or our application. And of course, they're basically going to be allowing the users to generate like magic images through the API with AI, of course. So we're going to use replicate and a bunch of other services alongside that one. But we're just going to receive like an image and a prompt from the user in here through our handlers. And we can delegate that to the actual replicate for the to process and everything. And it can get back to us. So here instead of the SRC, I can go ahead and create another folder. So for example, we'll do like, oh, magic. I'm just going to name it magic in here. And of course, I'm going to just do magic dot dot typescript. Um, and this one needs magic dot, uh, okay, so controller dot typescript. This will need as well magic dot service dot typescript. Okay. So of course, this is actually our Mordio in here. That's going to do the service and the controller. And we got our service in here. I'm just going to do like this method where it generate magic image. And it's going to take like a prompt and an image and everything and input. And it's basically going to return to you a new image URL for, you know, like the generated or the AI generated image for you. And yeah, so this is actually the service. I'm going to go back to the module in here. I'm just going to do providers. I'm going to just provide that as a service or as a provider. So just magic service for this. And that's it. So now before we do anything and before we can get started, we're gonna go ahead to replicate and actually set up replicate to work with our project. 
So replicating here is actually an awesome platform that allows you to run your custom AI models on the cloud and it just provides you with GPUs and everything with a super simple and easy API or maybe the feature I absolutely love is actually you can explore tons and tons of like different APIs or different models that are already deployed for you and they work as charm exclusive here like for example this one in 81k runs 7.6k runs there's a bunch of stuff in here from audio to text, text to audio, paintings, AI, text, so many cool stuff in here. And we're gonna use one of these cool models that are actually gonna do magic stuff for us. And of course, before you get started with Replicate and before you can start using their API, you're gonna go ahead and sign up for an account in here and you can just actually get started. So I already in here have my account set up and everything. I don't remember if you need to enter your credit cards or I really don't remember because it's been a very long time since I did sign up in here. But I think you do not need for like, you know, there's they have like a limit or free limit quota and you can use that for your, you know, stuff and runs. So yeah, you can benefit from that. Now, if you head over to the documentation in here and it just tells you how you want to use that one, I want to use this with Node.js because we use it Node.js with Node.js. So you can like install and do all that kind of stuff in here. So simply just do npm install replicate. You export this token in here, which is going to be grabbing from our dashboard after you create an account, of course. And you can use their simple API in here to run it however you want. That's basically what it is. It's super simple. And I think they provide a documentation inside of GitHub. So you have like their GitHub documentation here if you want like more deeper documentation of how it works. And particularly in here, how are we gonna be using it? Because we wanna use an image sort of like base model that takes an image and it takes a prompt and actually modifies that and creates a magical image for us. So this, we need to use an image and that's for, we need to like, encode our image in here using base64. So we're going to do base64 encoding for us in here. Then we take that data URI and actually pass it to the model or pass it to the replicate API for this to do its magic. And later on, it's actually going to return something for us like this, where replicate delivery and it just turns and returns for you like the image that was generated. So for this to work, to make sure to go back in here and actually copy the API token, you can actually generate a new token if you don't have one already, but I do have, click copy in here. It's gonna copy the full one. It's not gonna copy the one with the stars in here. And just go back to the environment variable in here and just create like, oh, replicate API token or something. And you just paste that one in there. Now, the next thing in here, you need to use PMPM PM to add a replicate, like install the replicate package so we can start using the SDK. All right, now, so inside of our magic service in here, I'm gonna go ahead and do like a constructor. So I'm gonna do, and inside of that one, I'm gonna just go ahead and create the replicate instance we've got. So I'm simply just gonna do this dot replicate equals new replicate. And this should go ahead and like import replicate for us. If it doesn't, we can just go on the top in here, import replicate from replicate, please. And this is actually the constructor. So we just like, as soon as we give it this, uh, it should work fine. And I think on the top in here, you just go ahead and do private um, replicate. And there's gonna be an instance of replicate in here that's gonna be, you know, initialized or no. Or maybe I don't need to initialize it. Just need to put replicate in there and just put replicate in here. Just gonna do new. And here for the authentication, so the auth, we should use process.env. Replicate API token, okay? And that's, we've got replicate initialized with our like, you know, authentication token we just put inside of our ENV file in here and everything should be good. Now, the two models that we wanna actually use, one of them, of course, is there's actually this photo maker, the style, which gives you this like art style, sort of like pixler movies, sort of style, like taking your picture, for example, you provide my picture right over here and just give me these really awesome pictures in here, writing and dragging or something and taking care from like, you know, starting from a prompt and an image and you can provide you know, different images of like your face or something, and it can start from that. Or the second one, which gives you an awesome one, it also allows you to start from an image in here and actually gives you way much better image, professional image. Like for example, there's an image for me and you can like upload different images as well, but we're just gonna use one image because I found it like to be the best, but you can, you can play around with more and you give it like a prompt in here, the style, a negative prompt in here and a different stuff that you can play around with. So I'm gonna go back to this model, the photo maker dash style, which is a stylation version of the other one and basically provides like with the API and everything and how it works. So I'm just gonna go ahead and actually use the API. So you see this input, I can use like Node.js. So it just tells you all the instructions of how you use it. We already initialized that, we have got that one. And now we can just go to run it this way. We do 
provide, I don't know why it's, so just provide, this is actually the, so I'm simply just gonna copy the whole thing in here, like copy the whole code snippet in here. And I'm actually gonna go back into this one and put it right over there. So now we can use like a weight with this dot replicate and it should run like that one. And this is actually our model we got and the different inputs we have in here. The most important part is actually the image. We need to provide the base 64 image. Now I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna leave all, all this all their parameters the same way, but only gonna play around with the prompt and actually the input image. These are actually the two inputs I need from the actual user for it, like to provide a prompt and provide an input image to start with, and that's it. And here for the number output, I just want one as well, just like I don't need two outputs. So the same thing is gonna go back again, it's gonna create a DTO in here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create like magic, I'm gonna do uh, DTO, and inside of that one, I'm gonna create um, magic dot dto dot typescript and just paste the same thing in here i'm just going to do the oh, magic dto and this one we don't need the email or any of that so we're just like gonna need the prompts in here which should be a string so a prompt is going to be a string in here and it needs to make sure it is actually a string so yes that's good and the other one is actually the image and image should be a string as well because the image it must be a base 64 encoded and all the encoding should either happen, you know, from like, because this actually we're just providing an API. So the user that actually gonna use that API should provide that base 64 image encoding. Or if you're using it for a front end application or something, you know, like whenever you drag and drop an image or something, that's where the file conversion happens from a normal binary file to a base 64 screw string, then it uses our API to send that through. So here, basically I'm just gonna do base 64 and underscore image, and that should be a string again, as I said before. And that's it. So now we've got the base 64 image, the prompt. I can go back in here into um, you know our generate image. I can just do magic. DTO to be magic DTO again. And through this one, we can just go down here. I can just go ahead and do oh, magic DTO, just acts as the base 64 image. And the same thing goes for the prompt on the top in here. So just do magic DTO dot prompt. Okay, cool. Now I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna get back an output in here. I can just gonna return the output just for now. And I'm gonna have like a console log just to see the output after I run this one. So instead of our control in here, I'm gonna use a post request. So I'm gonna just do post and I'm gonna do like full slash magic image. And this one should be having a body. So you can just do body uh, magic image or just magic D2O. It's gonna be like magic D2O again. But now we don't have like the constructor, so you can just go ahead and do the constructor and simply just do this magic service, generate image, ma like magic image in here and pass any the image or magic DTO in here and it should return a response for us. Now, we're gonna go ahead and actually use our postman and try it out. But before doing that, we need to go to like an online website or something where we can provide our binary image and this should convert it to us a base64 image. I chose this base64-image.de and uh, once you upload an image and it's gonna convert it automatically for you. So you do show code and you got your base64 on the top in here, not the CSS one, but this one in here. And you can click, oh, copy to clipboard, please. Now I can go back to Postman in here, I can do duplicate tab in here. And because our thing is actually just like magic image, and we need a post request for the body in here. We're gonna need like a prompt and a base64 underscore image. And this one is actually where we provide the base64 image, just pasting the string inside of that one. I know it's gonna be a really huge thing, but this is actually what you need to put. And the, for prompt in here, I can just go back and use the same prompt I did use before. So maybe a boy whistmickle 3D CGI or something, writing a dragon and everything. And go back in here, paste the prompt as well. And that's it, so you got the prompt, base64 image. Let's go ahead and run this one and see how it's gonna blow up. So we got request entity too large. And to make sure we actually fix that one, we need to go ahead into the main in here and actually just make sure our request JSON size and then we were encoded are, you know, have a bigger limit of like 50 megabytes. So to use that, I gotta go ahead and like import the JSON first from Express and as well as like the URL encoder from Express in here. And this should just go ahead and allow it to jump and actually exceed limits to 50 megabyte. 
And in here, it defaults to 100 kilobyte, but I don't want 50 megabyte because that's that's too much. I'm just gonna go with five megabytes. And here for your encoder as well, just five megabytes. And after exceeding that, it should work, but it's just telling us magic image doesn't exist. So we just gotta go ahead and actually make sure we import our module in here inside of this one. So we just go ahead and do imports auth module and make sure just to give it up oh, the magic controller or not the controller, sorry, it's a magic module in here just for it to be imported into work. And another area in here just says replicate default is not a constructor inside of this one. And this is just because on TypeScript in here, you need to introduce this ES module interrupt and make sure it's true because by default it is actually false. So this will just like convert, you know, uh, common JS modules into ES ESM modules. So they should work fine now. So if we go back in here, replicate should have no issues and the server should run fine. So let's go back. So if we go back in here, just to put a post an image and it's gonna take a little bit of time. I wanna just go back. And after a little bit of time, after the AI did run and everything, now we got this PNG in here back from replicate.delivery. So we should, I mean, if we click on it, it should take us to a browser. And there you go, that's our image. Just generated with an AI and it's from replicate and everything and it's working fine. Now, I mean, you can leave it this way. You can just like use the replicate CDN in here and just to pass it to people. Or maybe you can just go ahead and download the file immediately as an attachment to, you know, through the, the API request in here. And both of them should work fine. Or maybe you can just grab the PNG and host it in your service. So you don't let people know they're using replicate or anything. Just everything happens internally. All you give them back is just like your file or maybe using your CDN or something and just give them the, the URL of your CDN. I mean, there's actually a lot of ways to do that. It's uh, all of them actually is simple and, and it depends on the setup and you're gonna need like domain names and all that kind of stuff involved in for that to work. Now, there's actually one last thing left for this one is actually to make sure that this is guarded with an API key, but because right now, anybody that comes in, it can just go ahead and like, you know, just send a request. We're not doing any double checking. We're not like using the API key in here to double check. We need to use this API key header to make sure that the guy that's actually making this request has the right authorization to do so and for that to work perfectly. So we can go back to the magic and controller right over here. I can just go ahead and do like use, uh, not container, but just at use guards, okay. And this one, I can just go ahead and give it the card. So the guards for us are actually gonna be the auth guard. So this should go ahead and work. And for this to work, you need to go back into the auth in here. So where's the auth module? So you got auth module in here, we've got controllers, everything. And we need just to go ahead and do export auth guard and it has to be a, as a provider. So auth guard should be working as a provider as well. We need to export that auth guard. Now inside of the other one, where is that? So like we need to go back to the magic controller or sorry, the module in here. And you see this like import. We need to go in and do imports and I do the auth module as well. So we need to import the auth module in here in order to be able to use that one. So you simply just put use guards in here, auth guard in here, and everything's going to be taken care of because the auth guard in here is the one that's going to take care of like, you know, checking the request, the API key from the header, and checking if that API key is existing inside of the database or not, and yada, yada, yada. And also, we got to also import the DB module. So we're going to do database module. We got to import that because like we are using Prisma instead of like our magic service in here. So because we're using Prisma instead of like the auth module and everything. So we got to import both of these for that to work. All right, cool. So no errors in here. Everything looks fine. And if you go back to the magic image in here, we try to send a request with an invalid API key in here. We say, oh, forbidden resource. You cannot access that 403. Nothing is working. But if we go back in here where we are actually grabbing the access token, I think on the body in here, this is actually our API key and the route and everything. So if you go back to the API key in here, I can just provide my valid API key, click send. And now it looks like the request is passing because it's taken a little bit longer. That means it passed to the replicate sort of servers and the AI is doing such magic behind the scenes. And there you go, hallelujah. So we got replicate.delivery and this is basically the image that we've got. If you click on turn that one, that should be the newly generated image and that's what it looks like. And for implementing that download functionality, you can just add these 
like to the generate magic image or if like a header uh, content type in here that's gonna be returned as image PNG because that's what replicate generates for you. And you can do like, for example, content disposition, attachment, and the file name in here that that's gonna be downloaded eventually. And what you can actually go in and use is actually this HTTP service and make sure to use that after installing one module that's actually called Axios. And uh, I think I can find it right over here. So you do Axios called NestJS Axios and make sure to install as well as the Axios in here and if you go back in here you make sure to go to the module in here you import the HTTP module from NestJS Axios going back you do this HTTP service then you actually give it the URL in here so you like you access the URL by yourself you grab the response type in here as a stream because you want to restream that binary PNG file back to the user for the download so you just do pipe it through in here you use the RxJS tab in here you can find that all in documentation but you just pipe it through that one you create this stream in here of like whatever file name that you want to just put back and that's going to send the stream back of the actual image png in here that's generated by you know replicate is going to allow the user to download it to their computer I mean, there's tons and tons of ways you can approach that. You can create a UI, small UI for it, where you can drag and drop an image and enter a small prompt, click enter, you can see it. But but for this particular course, we went through of like creating a full sort of like RESTful API that is ready to make money for you. And of course, just like this is like a, a normal SaaS, a normal AI SaaS in here and how it works and how you can create that and how you can use AI features and replicate API and so many things. So the only thing left for that one is just to make it profitable stats where like you can accept payments and stuff is actually Stripe integration. So you can integrate Stripe or maybe you wanna do Gumroad, but of course, but I think Stripe is the best solution in this case for like subscription stuff or like one time payments or something. So there's like one last thing left is the payment integration. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching and catch you hopefully in another course.